Hello everybody. Today our guest is Dhanil Desai, the CEO and founder of Turtle Capital. I admire him a lot and he was one of the first few people that sparked my interest in value investing. He's a chemical engineer by education who went on to earn an MBA degree and started looking for value in the Indian stock market. He's focused um he has spotted many solid multibaggers over the past 10 years and he believes that for an average middle income individual it is possible to create wealth in the long term through disciplined and sustained investment in equity markets without taking unnecessary risk i am very happy to have him here today um so first off i would like to begin by asking him um to describe his investment philosophy and how it guides his investment decisions thanks sir uh, for having me um and uh, uh, you know uh, so essentially investment uh, philosophy wise uh, you know you know it's been a evolution since my journey started so when i started my investing journey i was more of a, a, a extremely deep value investor looking at net net typical which are mentioned by graham but uh, you know as things evolved and i learned from markets i realized that uh, you know uh, you know what interests me more is our good businesses available at a reasonable or cheap valuation so the kind of companies that i look at now and uh, how investment philosophy has evolved is that i look at uh, you know companies which are very decent business uh, are run by good management and are available at uh, reasonable valuation so that's the kind of Uh, you know investment style that currently i am practicing uh, and uh, you know what i believe is that you know as you go on in your investment journey your investment style also evolves with time uh, you know you learn from your market to your experiences and also a lot of vicarious learning happens so you know through all this means your investing style evolves with time so currently i'm practicing what typically they call gap which is you know uh, basically you try to buy good businesses at reasonable valuation okay um so so it's similar to how uh, for example um, buffett or munger they all started out with being uh, looking for graham value stocks cheap stocks and then moving on to great good businesses uh, at yeah, yeah. um so in in that uh, uh for, to a follow up to that basically so you said you like to buy great businesses at reasonable value or at fair value um so how do you then uh, determine the fair value of a stock or determine the intrinsic value of a stock uh and um can you provide a, a sort of an example of how your valuation process works um what are the different valuation methods you look at and how do you go about deciding that this is a reasonable value for a solid business right so uh, you know whatever that i have learned in the market that intrinsic value is a concept which is uh, you know kind of very easy to say but very difficult to apply uh, you know there are different uh, different aspects of intrinsic value depending upon which kind of business that you are looking at so if you are looking at a commodity business maybe you will look at replacement cost if you are looking at a growth business you will look at tcf and in tcf to you know what is the terminal value of a business you know creates a large part of your intrinsic value calculation and the terminal value decides decided by the discount rate that you apply so so a lot of moving parts of our intrinsic uh, value uh, what i have kind of you know as a practitioner of investing what i look at is that i look at a business try to understand the business model uh, and try to uh, look at industry dynamics and see you know what is the base economics of this business and given that base economics and my understanding of the business management uh, intention to take business to a certain level in next 3 to 5 years i look at the growth rate look at the margins arrive at uh, you know certain 
certain numbers in terms of earnings and then on that earnings you know what is the exit multiple that this kind of business will get you know that becomes my uh, you know exit valuation but then i took then i kind of go back and see at the current from current valuation uh, you know if i invest whether i'll make enough irr or whatever is my required irr whether i make that or not what i look at so essentially it's a calculation that you do based on a projection of a or earnings for next three to five years and you know while you do these projections essentially entry barriers everything into the numbers so the numbers are essentially the culmination of all your understanding of of the external and internal factors and then you know you try to assign a multiple depending upon looking at the peer set looking at you know you know what you think would be the fair value of this business or the fair valuation of this business will be uh, by the market and then then you go back and see where it trades today in terms of the market cap or valuation and see whether it meets your uh, irr expectations or not um so, so that's the kind of broad valuation of philosophy that I adopt. So, um, because in valuation, there are so many uh, changeables or so many things we can modify in order to uh, get the valuation uh, uh, or sort of get a, 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 a sort of a rough judgment of how the company is, is, is valued. So how do you so so with that i think earnings are something that is very important in valuation um so how do you go about deciding whether this is a sustainable or non-sustainable earnings in the business um and also uh how do you um get that uh rough uh, so because valuation is not a it's not an exact number as you said it's a, it requires a lot of um you know changing variables and etc so how do you get um that rough sort of uh a range of valuations and how do you decide when that uh you know the company is significantly uh below that range of valuation and that it will continue the, the growth rate in the future with the earnings and it isn't a one-time sort of a thing Right. So I think you you are looking at a couple of things. One is what is the sustainable earning of a business, right? So, uh, so essentially, you know, what I've realized over the years is that most of the businesses are mean reverting, and uh, you know, uh, so what happens is that you look at the company has a you know long history. You go back in the past. And see over a period of let's say seven, eight, ten years, what kind of margin this company has earned. Uh, you know what kind of growth rate this company has displayed. Uh, and then you kind of try to see current margins and see whether they are above or below historical averages. So that's one of the things that you definitely would want to look at it. If the current margins are significantly above or below the historical averages, you need to ask questions. You know why so and if if there are factors contributing to that uh, uh that variability uh then whether those factors will continue in future uh so well, those are the things that you look at from the historical perspective you then also go back and look at the peers uh you know if if let's say company a is making 20 percent margins and everybody in the industry is making 15 percent margins then you need to really ask hard questions as to whether this 20% margin is sustainable or not. Uh, because on an average, as I said, most of the businesses are mean reverting. Uh, and uh, very few businesses have pricing power and entry barriers strong enough 
uh, to have a margin which are significantly above peers. So, so these are the kind of things that you look at and then determine what is the sustainable earnings. Uh, I think that's more of a uh, art. It's data driven, but it's also an art because you also have to have a context around what is happening on the business side of it. So uh, it's very difficult uh, to say that because the data says so, you know, the margins will be uh, sustainable or not sustainable. Uh, you you have to apply context. Uh, so uh, to give you an example, uh, you know, typically in a chemical company, you get to see, uh, you know, very few companies above forty percent. But in my investing time timeline, I have come across a couple of companies, uh, at least three companies, which have uh, demonstrated growth mar gross margin of. 50% plus for a decade or more, right? So then, uh, you know, that's more of an aberration if you look at the entire industry set. Uh, so then you have to ask the question as to why these companies are able to derive such high cross margins. Uh, are they operating uh, in an environment where there are only a handful of players are there? That's the first question. Second, are they bringing so much efficiency in their overall processing where uh, you know they are able to derive add more value uh, uh, to the customer and hence they are able to uh, you know create that margin so those are the kind of factors then you kind of you know uh, drill down to and then again try to see whether whether some of your hypothesis around those cross margins being sustainable uh, will hold to the time uh, because one of the things that I've realized is that if you buy something, uh, you know, where, you know, where, where you think that the margins are sustainable and your hypothesis is wrong, the, the value destruction that happens is uh, pretty large. So, uh, so you have to be very careful, uh, you know, anything uh, which is kind of, you know, not aligned to the historical reference points or industry peer reference points. Uh, you know, the sustainability of that has to be kind of, you know, determined, uh, you know, with a, uh, with, with kind of very close observation data point, you know, you, you really have to justify that. Right. Yeah. I agree with you that uh, you need to, you need to look at the past, uh, say balance sheets or the past um, cash flow statements, see how the company has been doing in the past, compare it to the industry, and then look and see whether, you know, it, it really has something um, related to the industry and how it's doing um, relatively. But uh, in most situations, I feel that when a company is available cheap, um, Mr. Market usually has a reason um, for that. It could be a, a, a stupid reason, but usually the Mr. Market has a, a reason behind the company's valuation. So uh, which can also affect, you know, how much you put growth rates into the business, because it could mean that the business might be facing a headwind. So how do you differentiate uh, between the news that suggests that there's actually something wrong with the business or something that's a short term headwind, because there's like the line can be blurred sometimes so do you have a framework for it or do you have sort of a, a list of questions that you go through to decide whether um whether it really uh isn't affecting the business over the long period of time and that it can be sustained uh in the valuation as well i think uh, you know to answer this question one has to really uh then go back and see whether a particular event or a headwind uh, will impact the earnings of the company or earning power of the company, right? So those are two very different things. Uh, you know, anything which impacts the earnings of the company uh, but doesn't impact the earning power of a company, uh, you know, would be more, uh, you know, short term in nature. Uh, but something which actually impacts the earning power of a company uh, you know, that would actually, uh, you know, kind of uh, have a long-term impact on the earnings of company. So to give you an example, uh, 
uh, let's say in automotive space. Currently, the entire shift that is happening uh, from uh, anything which is ICE engine to EV, right? Uh, now, any company which is uh, highly exposed to ICE engines, yeah. uh, you know, any auto and ancillaries or an automotive company which is exposed to that and not recalibrating to the EV side of it will have some impact on this earning power, the future earning power. Uh, because even though the ICE engine market is here to stay, the incremental market or growth uh, may be dampened because the shift to EVs that is happening, right? So, 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 so that's a long-term earning power uh, dent that you are looking at. While let's say you know what is happening on the chemical side, chemical industry currently where you know everybody is flush with inventory uh, you know and then uh, because of that the demand is down the prices is down the margins have taken a hit but eventually that inventory will get normalized and the base demand is not going anywhere so that's more of a short term in nature so that's a, that impacts your earning for maybe a year or two but doesn't impact your earning power so so you have to kind of distinguish between what impacts your earning and what impacts your earning power. If something that impacts your earning power, you have to be slightly more worried and uh, you also have to be more cautious in terms of what valuation that you pay for buying such business. So um, so when you so when you're looking at a at a business and and judging based on whether it affects the earnings or the earnings power, um is there um or sometimes you know these if 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 a company is being hit badly on the earning power um or if an entire industry is going through a shift and then they're facing issues um say in in manufacturing or issues in the headwinds because they have more competitors popping up or there's better alternatives in the business um there tends to be a sort of reflection of that on um the company's financial statements or the company's uh uh basically quantitatively um on the company so what are some of the red flags or some of the warning signs or some things that really make you uh when you look at a company's financial statement that make you think okay there might be a shift going around and there might be something that might be affecting uh, the pricing power or the earning power of a business so so more than the financial statement uh, what happens is that uh, the industry growth rate can kind of you know tapers down so when industry growth rates taper down, let's say industry was growing, you know, at a global level, seven to ten percent, right? After some shift happening on the industry side, which is structural in nature, the industry growth rate will go down to let's say two three percent. So that delta of four five percent growth going away will have a very large ramification on on the scale. Uh, so so that is. Rather than financial statement, it's the external environment that industry level you monitor, you know, all those things. Uh, also, what will happen is that because, you know, the pie is not growing, all the players would try to then kind of, you know, maximize the output and then kind of try to utilize their capacity to the maximum, you know, try to gain market share in whatever is the pie that is remaining. And that will eventually lead to the margin pressure. So that competitive intensity will you know rise significantly, and then eventually will kind of uh, you know be reflected in margins being squeezed one way or the other. Uh, another repercussion of that is that you know the customer uh, you know the essentially it will become a bias market, right? Because there are more people uh, you know ready to supply at lower prices and once it becomes bias market essentially that also will in some way reflected on your balance sheet side in terms of hard working capital requirement so these are the typical uh, 
these are the typical uh, connotations of what you are saying. But what happens is that if you are not able to get this thing right, that industry shift is happening and industry level changes are happening in when the growth rates are slowing down, these are more of a lag indicator, right? So margin pressure will come later, working capital pressure will come later, but market will factor in all these things much earlier. So the value destruction will happen much earlier. So look at the newsprint industry, right? That's a that's an industry which has been kind of you know doing good cash flows, balance sheets are very good, but market has already discounted that this industry you know is on the way down, and hence the term, the terminal value of those businesses continue to go down, and hence the multiples that they command will shrink. So even before it gets manifested in in, in PNL or balance sheet, it will get manifested in a valuation. So it's very important to understand, you know, if the industry, uh, you know, shifts are happening, you have to be ahead of the curve uh, and uh, kind of not be exposed to those factors, uh, you know. Uh, otherwise, the value destruction can be quite large. Yeah, it is. It is important to to understand whether whether a shift is happening, and and yeah, the market does tend to um, do that with companies with much lower growth rates and give um, higher multiples with those with higher growth rates. Uh, um, so because it it requires a lot of qualitative analysis. Um, how do you analyze a company's competitive positioning? Then how do you decide whether this company has the earning power and it is able to defend itself against say new entrants new disruptors that could possibly uh, affect the company um as in in and how do you basically figure out whether the company really has a moat or it's a sort of a fake illusionary moat so so again uh in my humble opinion, moat is something which is kind of, you know, now everybody talks about. Um, but moat is actually kind of over glorified because uh, very, very few businesses have real moat. Uh, you know, most of the businesses have some entry barriers, some have moderate, some have, you know, very strong entry barriers. But moats where, you know, when where, where a business can be defended for decades, and the pricing power can be demonstrated are very few and far between. So, uh, so, so, but even within the kind of businesses that we look at, where where moats may be transient in nature, uh, but but entry barriers are there, and typically entry barriers are created by you know something called uh, scale. If you have a very large scale, your cost of production is very low. You are the lowest cost producer, and hence nobody else can compete, and hence you know, uh, hence you continue to take market share. Second is the approval process. A lot of the businesses, uh, you know, where which are B two B in nature, the approval process itself is long enough, and you know, customer will typically take, uh, you know, three four years for your products to approve. You know, they engage with you right from the design stage, and then kind of build product is commercialized you know customers are in the department or a product design department is always involved with you uh, or your team uh, in that entire process so that way you know you are creating you know they are also investing a lot of time energy and resources into this so the entry barrier for competitor becomes difficult uh, third thing uh, from where actually the entry barrier come is the you know the IP part, the patents, copyright, the brand. Those are the things again you know that create entry barrier. Fourth thing that creates entry barrier is distribution, right? I think in a vast country like India, creating a very large distribution is is takes years of hard work, a lot of money. Uh, it's not easy to replicate. So that's why you see some of the FMCG companies, which were built from 1970s, 80s till now, have such a large, uh, you know, headway over everybody else because they have 
such a large distribution network that if you want to create that kind of a distribution network, it will take you many years, it will take you, you know, a uh, very large amount of money and hence, you know, they remain in a position where in certain products, certain segments, certain geographies, they are able to kind of defend their business very well. So this combination of brand and distribution itself uh, also is an entry barrier. So we look at business more in terms of entry barriers, you know, you know, rather than modes, because uh, all these entry barriers can be overcome with some amount of, you know, time, energy, capital. It's not that you can't recreate that, but the you get four, five, six years of runway um, before somebody else can come in and then compete with you, uh, you know, on an equal term. So, uh, so those are the kind of things we look at. Um, yeah.